Welcome. I guess that's everyone. Okay, now I guess it's my turn to start talking. Huh? All right. What to set a let's set a let's what are we doing here? Uh, to be clear, um, what I'm sharing with you is my personal experience in communication throughout the tenure of my entire career, real estate and previous. It is not my assumption that what I tell you, you should just go run and do. I'm saying that what I'm sharing with you is what has taken me years to figure out and has worked really well for me and my relationships with agents, buyers, sellers, when I am in interacting with them, my own family, my friends, everything is improved because of these interactions that I've had and communications that I've had throughout my career and the learning that I've adopted in order to attempt to try to connect with people better. Um, there have been, let's be realistic as we go through this. Um, so I spent a lot of my career, just like a lot of people, self-help. We talked about that before we started. Self-help. And I'm not knocking self-help. Tony Robbins, who am I to speak to, to speak on him? Malcolm Gladwell, all these people. Amazing books, amazing information. What I'm saying is I think it does have limitations in my experience. And I, to be very clear, I'm talking about self-help outside of the real estate industry. Now I'm going to get a little critical for a minute. If you want to talk about education inside the real estate industry, it has been my, I'm talking, to be clear, I'm no longer NAR board of director. I'm talking about NAR on down. It is my belief that NAR and these major franchises that pitch to people, these small brokers, that we don't know what we're doing because we need this massive education. I, I'm not knocking what they're doing. They're trying to move their people forward as well. What I'm saying is it's been my experience that their education has limited my ability to achieve the connections with buyers, sellers, and agents that I was able to find on my own outside of the real estate sector. So all the education that we talk about, I don't know of one thing we'll talk about that I learned from a real estate sector. Information piece, self-help book, how to knock doors. I was with Mike Ferry coaching for a long time, and that is where I learned what I learned that trajected me to the point where the first year I was with Mike Ferry, I went from $100,000 to $300,000 in income in one year. So I am not saying that self-help does not work. I'm saying that I thought I could run the world 15 years ago when Mike Ferry had me making $300,000, and then I realized the limitations because I was so focused on money and I was so focused on greed and I was a nice person. I wasn't pushing anyone. I was just like I am today. But I wasn't really connecting, to, connecting with the people. I was seeing the objection was over there. And it's very easy. I just got to navigate them over here, get them to sit right there, and then I've won. And what I'm saying is that's to me, is not the answer. To me now, I sit down and I've established what I call a person-centered approach to real estate. So I'm, we're going to, I want to decouple the idea that personality styles, once you figure those out, first of all, that those are the answer, because I don't believe that to be. Um, we'll get into that. Um, but I believe personality traits are more the answer. And to give you an example of what that means, I, I didn't think I could do this on the fly. So I spent about three hours putting this together. Um, as you can see, if you'd like me to autograph it and take a picture with, you know, whatever. Right here, where's my marker? I want you know, I want like animation. I want to do something fun. Okay, let's see how bad my penmanship is. This is it. Does anyone know that this is my example of an equalizer? Could you possibly think that's what that was? I doubt that. I doubt that. Did someone say they did? You thought it was an equalizer? That's mother hen. She just she just knows me so well. This is an equalizer. You know what happens when you turn one up? This to me is personality styles. This is what we've learned our entire career. They'll tell you the way you know. Oh, you got to get in our, before you even sit, I'm sorry, I'm not knocking your company. I'm just being honest. I'll be honest and I'll tell you the truth. And that means the truth on knocking myself. So don't worry about it. But personality styles. Oh, before you even join this company, we need to, you, we need to know your personality style. We need to know your personality style. Just to be clear in the science community, who can guess? I, I will take three guesses. Who can guess in the science community what personality styles are called at times? Does anyone want to guess? Just guess something. What, what do they call in the science community? What do they call personality styles? Well, Myers-Briggs, good. Myers-Briggs is a personality style. Let's start there. Who, disc, disc. Oh my gosh, how many times in my life have I heard, Michael's a high D. Michael's a high D. Stop talking about my D, please. 
So, what? <laughs> that got me distracted. So, per <laughs> personality styles, though, are telling you we want to stereotype you. That's what this is. We need to sit down with you. We need you to answer some questions. I need to say this person is a high D. This person's analytical. This person's uh, expressive. And then the entire time of our relationship, the only thing I'll do is feed into the fact that I think that I'm stereotyping the fact that you are an expressive, that you are an amiable personality, that you're a driver, whatever you want, whatever Myers-Briggs or, or DISC or any of these ones that they've come up with, these are all running the equalizer like this. They're saying you're analytical and you're none of these things. You're whatever and none of these things. You're high D. This is personality traits. Personality traits is the equalizer that's constantly moving in the and it's embodied in all of us. So the things we'll talk about, all of us have. And all of us can move these equalizers depending on the environment that we surround ourselves with. So it isn't that you're just born. At birth, you're not this, you're not this, you're not this, you are this. That's not the way it is. That's not the way it is at all. In interactions, when I interact with Barb, one day the EQ, the EQ may look like this for me or her. The other, it may look like this. It may shift depending on the needs of the conversation, the environment, and what we're talking about. So by doing this, when you sit down in front of your buyers and sellers, you're no longer shaking their hand saying, oh, analytical, he wants to talk about numbers, she wants to talk about numbers, let's just talk about numbers. And then when they start to act out of character, all you're, you're trying to figure it out, but you've pigeonholed them to such a point you're just looking at, oh, it's because we didn't go into the numbers well enough. We didn't go into the numbers well enough. That's not the case. Everyone has personality traits. Everyone's personality traits are constantly moving, but you have to have these traits in order to be experiencing the human condition in its fullest. Lecture overview. What I just said, that was just rambling. This is actually what I wrote down. Lecture overview. Today we'll explore how a deeper understanding of personality traits rather than the broader personality styles can be significantly enhanced. It can significantly enhance our interactions and success in real estate. We'll delve into the big five personality traits the science behind them, and how they apply to our industry. Okay, here's our agenda for today. We should have plenty of time. Um, introduction of personality traits, a deep dive into the big five personality traits, awareness, active listening, and empathy, adapting communication strategies, building authentic client relationships, and conclusion and actionable takeaways. That's what we're going to navigate, and let's see how quickly I can do it because I know you want to get to the booze. <laughs> Objectives. By the end of this lecture, you'll gain insight into how personality traits influence client behavior, learn techniques for effective communication and relationship building, and discover actionable steps to apply these principles in your real estate practice. Once I stopped walking into listing appointments saying, analytical, it's, it changed my life. Once I stopped judging people, stereotyping people, which by the way, years I'd probably not admit that, but that's really what we were doing with personality styles, just to be clear. Section one, introduction to personality traits. Shift from broad styles to nuanced traits in client understanding. Personality traits provide a deeper dynamic view of client behaviors and essential for tailoring real estate interactions and improving client relationships. I think I hit that to the point pretty well. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Op here, are the o here is the overview of the big five. Openness, conscientiousness, extra extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. I forgot, this morning I thought, you know what, I want to go back and I want to put the definition of neuroticism in there because every time I talk about this, people are like, neuroticism, my pearls. You know, like, they hear that word and for me to say you have neuroticism in you, they'll think, oh my gosh, that's offensive. He thinks I'm neurotic. We are all neurotic. You have to be neurotic to survive. It's part of the human condition. We are all neurotic. It's about how much neuroticism in that given time do you have. It's the situation. We all have neuroticism. All right, Michael's full of crap. What he's talking about, right, is just, he's saying this is personal experience. Well, so what? My personal experience was I crossed the street this morning. It doesn't make me a better real estate agent. Well, here's a study. I'm sure NAR put this out, right? You read this, right, from NAR? No, Frontiers in Psychology actually did a, t a study on their own. This was, it had nothing to do with our industry about real estate brokers. Keep in mind in this uh, survey, in some states like Colorado, they call broker, they call agents brokers. So it's not just brokers as in, as in owners, it's brokers as in agents. 
The influence of real estate brokers' personalities, psychological empowerment, social capital, and knowledge sharing on their innovation performance, the moderating effect of moral hazard. With this, with this study, what it's basically saying, which I think is fascinating, that I have the PDF if anyone wants it um, in its entirety. It's long and boring, but there's a lot of great information in there. But when you start reading situations like these studies that are scientifically based, and we never hear about them through our major franchises or, or NAR or any of these people, why is that? Well, because learning things like this will put us in control and not the other people in control because it's my belief system. We're going get, to get your tinfoil hats out. It's my belief system that one of NAR's initiatives is not, to, not just to provide a service, to be clear, um, where I feel that one of their initiatives is trying to keep a million and a half realtors with a license so they can get money. And I mean, there's tons of people at NAR that are doing great things and they're friends of mine. Um, but right now, especially, I think we can all agree that NAR has forced us into situations we normally wouldn't be in, forced us into liabilities. So that's where I stand right now as far as the education in this industry. All right. Am I bitching too much? Am I complaining too much? It's good. I know the, the agents are all raw. They're like, no, throw something. Hit, break that window. <laughs> Start a car fire. Okay. Frontiers in psychology. By the way, anyone that wants these slide decks afterwards, share them away. I'll actually share the entirety of my notes that I'm not listening to at all. But I wrote all this really great information that I wanted to talk about, but I kind of, my agents know we just kind of go off the cuff here. Like, look at this gold right here. Look at this gold. Are you, when you start looking at this and you decide whether or not you want to adopt some of the things that have worked for me or not, when you start to look at this and you say, that's just not for me, you want to undermine maybe the messaging first. Like, he just doesn't know what he's talking about, or maybe he does, but, you know, his circumstances are different. He wears suits and, you know, he says weird things. So we're just different. That's just not for me. Ask yourself this. I wrote this this morning, actually. It's in, it's in the ink part. So I'll give you the whole thing. Are you growing old or are you old and growing? That's what we have to ask ourselves because to me in this industry, so many people, you learn to achieve 2 million in production, 3 million in production, 7 million in production, 35 million in production, and then you just hang it up. You're 27 years old. I know everything there is to know. I'm the greatest in the world. I'm the best ever because you, your ego gets to a point where it's so inflated, not because, keep in mind, it's in my experience the ego gets inflated not because you know so much it's because the more you learn the more you start to understand maybe i'm not as good as i thought i was maybe i don't know as much as i thought i do and so what you have to do is say well i sold 10 million last year i'm going to pump my ego up and i'm just going to be the 10 million dollar producer so all i'm going to talk about is that i sold 10 million this year all my clients are going to see is how many houses i sold this month Everything about me is transactional. Nothing about me is human. And by the way, if, if you're sitting there, and let's just be honest with each other. If you're sitting there and you're saying, well, that's not me because at closing, I take a picture with my clients and they hold a sign that says sold and we're all smiling. All right, all right. Are your clients your clients in that instance or are your clients a prop? They're a prop for advertisement. Are, they're happy, yeah. You could actually probably punch them in the head and they'd still kind of be happy at the moment if they like the house. So let's not go with, they love it. They love it. They're so happy. Yeah, they just bought the, the dream home. You could, despite you, they still like you. <laughs> so let's be realistic here. Um, I don't think that's human-centric. I think that's transactional-centric. It's not even just about me, me trying to make 10 million in sales next, month, next year. It's about me continuing to have something that says I'm, so, I'm worth this amount. And I want to project my advertisement, to sh uh, advertisement not to show what I know and what I'm about and my belief system like a normal human being. The reason our industry is so hated is because all, so many of us will sit there and make everything about us. Everything about us. So don't think I'm sitting here saying, I'm high and mighty. I'm sharing with you where I was and where I went and where I am now and where I'll be. To mo if you come here in five years, I'm sure I'll be talking mad crap on the stuff I'm talking right now. And it's not that it's wrong. It's because I continually, I continually want to progress and grow. I am proud of the person I am today, and I'm proud of the person I'll be in 10 more years. And I want us to adopt that same way of thinking. What I've noticed since this lawsuit and all of these things is so many agents are saying what I'm really scared of. And I'll, I'll tell and say, what are you scared of? What, what, what? 
Of course, the rumination fear that they're just sitting there thinking they're not good enough. I'm not good enough. They're not saying it that way, but that's what they're saying inside. I'm not good enough. I think I'm not good enough, and this is going to expose me for not being good enough. That's what I think a lot of people, are, a lot of agents are up against, is that they don't feel good enough. And I'm saying that you are good enough, and if you allow your ego to dissolve down to see that you can be vulnerable, we can look at ourselves and what we're doing right now and say the reason we're so hated and the reason this lawsuit won and the reason everyone's like, yeah, screw the realtors, is because of us. It's not them. It's us. We are the problem. And if we keep acting the same way, we'll continue to be the problem. Here's what I love, though. We have the opportunity now, I think, that gives us eventually will give us more creativity and more flexibility than we've ever had. And I think that through this process, we will see a, a drastic erosion of agents with marginal to less than marginal skill sets or lazy. And um, the people that are starting to have messages beyond the standard uh, knock on 50 doors and I'll show you how to I'll show you how to tie down. We would do things called tie downs. You tie someone down. I ask them questions. We're going we're to talk about asking people questions and caring about the answer as opposed to asking people questions because I want to direct them here. I want to make them go here. And what I'm actually doing is I'm asking them questions that I'm going to push them right in that corner. And once they get in that corner, I've navigated those questions. So they're so pushed in that corner that they feel trapped and they have to, they have to decide to buy, list, or sell with me. And I'm, by the way, I wasn't some evil demon. If you think that I was just like, I was just like this. But I believed in what I was doing, and I was just being marginal. I was being like every other real estate agent. I became that. I didn't have magnets on my cars or anything like that. I still wore suits and was respectable, in my opinion. But um, And if you have magnets on your car, good for you, whatever. It's just not for me. Um, <laughs> be careful what I say sometimes. Um, I don't know everyone in this room today. But all right, here we go. Let's get going here. So I'm sure you read that already, but basically what the Frontiers of Real Estate, set, Frontiers of Real Estate says in that, in that study is that people, brokers, or agents that have strong big five traits, especially in empathy and various depths that we're going to talk about with the big five personality traits, they have the most likely um, ability to succeed through empirical evidence and the people that, the exception is the people that have the ability or need or desire to possibly push morality. So when I say I'm going to strong arm you and push that, push that pen in front of you, not to try to intimidate you, but let's be honest, isn't that what that is? And that's intimidation. Um, when you start to do that, if you're willing to do those sorts of things, then you somehow it connects to the fact that your empathy and all these things you believe you are, which is what I believe that was, those start to erode. And your connection with those people actually is worse. The people that have the strongest connection and the best results are those with the strongest person, the strongest awareness of their empathy and various personality traits and are able to amplify every single aspect of that. One more thing I'll talk about that briefly is the other problem with these personality styles is uh, our own self-assessment. So then when I'm in situations with the seller, it's not the fact that they had concerns that I wasn't addressing appropriately as, as to why I lost the listing. It was because I'm a driver and they're an analytical and we just, analyticals just drive me crazy. You know, that was what I would say. Well, no, how about you be really good at being an analytical in that moment if that's what they want you to be and they need you to be the numbers. In environments with, there, here we go. Environments with higher levels of moral hazard, the effect of social capital on knowledge sharing diminishes, meaning this is, my own, this is my own synopsis here. If brokers are more inclined to take risks for personal gain, moral hazards, this can reduce the benefits that social capital like trust and network connections would normally have. All right, let's see here. Here we go. Awareness, active listening, and empathy. Uh, I'll read these three for you and then I'll just start blabbing my mouth. Definition of awareness, active listening, and empathy in client communications, we'll get into that the role of empathy and understanding and connecting with clients, and the impact on building trust and facilitating successful real estate transactions. Okay, empathy. Who here sees a commercial with you know, homeless kittens? I'm trying to do things that are not actually like really like emotionally uh, travesties, but let's say homeless kittens or something. Who here sees things on TV, those infomercials where you can donate money, various good causes? Who sees those and empathizes with that messaging? 
almost everyone, almost, pretty much everyone, a lot of people. And who here believes that's that, because I believe it is, who here believes that's empathy? I'm not setting you up for failure. I believe it's empathy. Everyone believes it's empathy. All right, so now we're all empathetic. We don't need to talk about this section. Is that correct? <laughs> here's, the, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. If I were to say to you, I'm your client, and it doesn't matter who it is. If I were to say to you, I feel grace. I do not actually feel this. Michael Pierce does not actually feel this. Grace, I feel as though you're not empathetic for me. Would that, and I'm not asking you your opinion, would that in general offend some of you? Inside at least, like, they told me I wasn't empathetic. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's natural. It's accept I, completely acceptable behavior to think they thought I wasn't empathetic. <clears throat> Screw them. I'm empathetic. Well, let's be clear here. Empathy isn't something that is so visual and visceral to say, look at this. This person has a broken leg. Oh, my gosh. This 12-year-old has a broken leg. I feel, I'm so empathetic. Every, every human being has that. Empathy is when someone has an opinion different than you and you don't get offended. You can empathize and say, Grace can say, Michael, my seller, fictional guy, thought I did not have empathy. So their opinion is valid. That is empathy. Their opinion is valid. Does that mean you do not have empathy? No. That means that at times, maybe you're not displaying empathy to a degree where you're connecting with them so they feel that there's empathy. So when you have sellers or clients, buyers, you sit down in front of those clients and they say you're not something. Or they say, let's say you just want, you want X and they want Y. And you're, you, leave the, you leave the appointment and you're like, I'm so damn frustrated. Why don't they see my way? That's because you're not being empathetic. That is why they don't see your way. If you could truly empathize with them, truly empathize with them, then you have to take into account that their feelings are valid completely. doesn't define who you are as a person. If they're saying you're not calling us enough, you're, you're making us feel like you're not doing anything, does that mean you're not doing anything? No. That means that they have concerns about how you're operating. And it could just be your communication, which is oftentimes the major problem that I see. Okay, awareness. The ability to be conscious of, feel, or perceive, <laughs> damn, or read, perceive internal and external environments. In the context of real estate, it refers to an agent's ability to be cognizant of their own biases, client needs, and the nuances of the interaction. You're aware of your own biases. What is one bias? That we would like them to list the house with me? That's a bias. That's a bias all of us have. One of the objections, oh, we hear it a lot. Oh, the neighbors, they actually have a cousin that wants to buy this thing. And I think we might be able to work this out. So we could just sell it directly to them and we're out. But let's look at what you're trying to navigate here. You're trying to navigate a buyer that wants to take you off the market so they don't have to compete against other buyers. Let's be very clear, that is what's happening in those situations. But in the human agent experiment, you internalize a belief system, a way of being, a way of living with your every communication, not just with your sellers and buyers. And it's been my experience that by navigating in such a way that you're truly connecting with people, that anywhere you are in your life where interactions require progress, that you will be more beneficial going this path instead of the other. So, by the way, I don't say this is the answer. I say, I understand. They're just removing the competition. Keep in mind, getting the house under contract is not, is not the, uh, the last end-all, be-all where you need leverage. You need leverage in inspections. You need leverage on the appraisal. And if you had a bunch of other buyers, even if you don't have backup offers, the fact that they don't know what else you may or may not have interest out there of, that helps you with uh, negotiating leverage when there's nothing, when there's no other game in town, it really is difficult. And that's truly what I believe. Um, but I acknowledge what the seller said. Make sure that you acknowledge, like sit down and really say, I completely understand why it would be beneficial to be able to not pay X percent in commission and be able to sell it directly, not have to get it ready, not have to stage it, not have to do this, not have to clean, not have to get the kids ready. Completely get it. See, I'm not just saying what she said and then ramming over for, to get to the solution. Objection, Handley. I'm truly empathizing. Why would she say that? That's what I thought. I was, on the, I was walking on a trail last night when I got that. 
I was like, what's the seller thinking? What's the seller thinking? Oh, the seller, it's not just the money. It's not just the money. The convenience. Oh, I'm not happy to deal with the kids. So I put all, you know, make sure you're empathizing. And guess what? That doesn't, it's not a foolproof plan. They're still human beings. But it's your job just to present the best transparent idea you can and allow them to make the decision that's best for them. So she came back and said, no, I want to do it. What should I say now? Fully support her in her decision. If you want to keep that client and you want to treat them like a human and a friend, that at this point you've conveyed what you believe, now show her truly you support her no matter what. Even if she doesn't do what you want her to do, you shared with her already your concerns. Now she's saying, I don't want to do that. And to have empathy means to say, I completely support you in your decisions and I'll be here if it doesn't work out. And that's real empathy and that's the difference between personality traits and personality styles. Active listening, a communication technique that requires the listener to fully concentrate, you can read that. Active listening is, in my experience, the most horrific I've seen in an industry in the real estate industry. Every, let me not use, let me not use absolutes. By the way, I have a beautiful note in my intro now that I remember, all or nothing thinking is trash. So all or nothing thinking, that's, you have to get out of that mindset. You have to understand that active listening is not saying, uh, while I'm going to allow them five minutes to just ramble and talk, and the whole time I'm just thinking about all the objection handlers and what I'm going to say next. That's not active listening. Okay, we, I, really need to, I really need to tell them that the house smells like cat pee. Uh, and they've talked for five minutes about um, how concerned they are about being able to afford their next purchase. And I've literally listened to nothing because I just really need to figure out how to nicely say the house, house smells like cat pee. This is not active listening. And in my experience, I, re I recruit a lot. As you know, I sit down with a lot of agents. And over time, I used to be a consultant for the MLS and KCRER. I used to be a brokerage consultant. I've sat down with a lot of brokers across the country and a lot of agents. And most of the time, they hire me at the time when I was in that business. And I will, and for three minutes, my message, they're like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. This guy's going to help our business. And then within five, ten minutes, they're back to their old thing, which is what? I know so much and I really need to, I really need you to know how much I know. I really need you to know how much I know. So whatever you just said, let's get past that because you've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. That's what I see in this industry. No active listening. I could see it in the eyes. I see it in people. They are not listening to me right now. I could literally say something insane and they would just be like, oh my God, yeah, right? I know, right? <laughs> so, so, I'm so there, Michael. I jumped off a bridge last night. Oh, me too. <laughs> so active listening. It's about sitting down with your sellers without a preconceived notion of what you want to say next. I don't, just go in with a complete blank slate. I, I don't know what they want, what their desires are, where they want to go. Even if you pre-qualified, you have this questionnaire, you have basic questions, where are you going next, you know, what, you know, all of the, what's your motivation? Because if you don't know your client's motivation, by the way, that's the first and foremost thing you need to know. Why are they doing this? Uh, you, oh, here, here's the real estate. Let's, let's rag on our own industry some more. Remember when Simon Sinek came out with that TED Talk, The Power of Why? And then every real estate agent you ever heard was like, it's really about their why. It's really about their why. Did you ever even read the book? Have you ever read a book before? <laughs> I, think, I think that we are a, our, our industry is a collective consciousness, C.G. June from the 60s, that believe that the world as a whole is a collective consciousness. So um, the things I'm contributing here will, in general, move the needle forward around our general community. But in general, we're all kind of learning and, and grasping on one basic narrative. And in social media, especially, the collective consciousness of our industry, especially through social media, is when I get in front of a real estate agent, it doesn't matter if they're Keller Williams or Reese Nichols, it doesn't matter, but that narrative is going to be very, very similar. Because they heard the same things on social media, they've heard the same concerns, they're all in a real estate agent collective consciousness, meaning that we're getting dumbed down by the masses. We are dumber because of the education that we're exposing ourselves to and the social networks that we're connecting ourselves with. So the collective consciousness is moving us back. We've got to get out of that. We've got to decouple from the collective consciousness and start to make moves on our own that navigate in a way so we can actually be independent business owners. Because 
how is it so that Keller Williams can have such an amazing training program? All, they have a class. How many classes do you have a month? 30, 50? There's classes all the time. And I'm not knocking that. Educate yourself. But how can they have all this education and, and the leadership say, we are not Berkshire Hathaway. And Berkshire Hathaway can say, we're not Keller Williams. And then you sit down with their agents and all of them sound and act exactly the same. None of them have different ideas. No one's doing anything differently. They're all complaining actually about the same thing because that's what most, most of my interactions are people trying to feel important by telling me all the things they've done. And I'll spend 45, I will spend an hour with an agent and say three words. Let's, let, me be, let me not exaggerate. I'll say 15 sentences in one hour, and when we're done, they'll say, I have never connected with someone as well as I've connected with you. <laughs> I doubt you even know if I have children. <laughs> so let's be realistic here. This is what I'm seeing. And I made a decision at some point, I guess when I was in Mike Ferry, I made the decision that I don't feel, I've looked at under every rock I can, and I don't feel the real estate industry has anything for me as far as educating me any further. And once I made that decision to move, my friends are not in real estate. All, my, my friends are my SEEK agents, and we chat all the time. We got the lunch. I was with Elizabeth Mortimer yesterday at lunch. We, I'm very social with our agents. I am not in the, the collective consciousness that's dumbing everyone down, because when I get into it, if I just scroll any other lawsuit comes up, I make my own video. I don't pay attention to what anyone else is saying. And then everyone's telling me about all these things they're hearing. I go on Instagram, scroll for like half an hour. I'm like, oh my God, it's disgusting out here. That's gross. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to operate like that. John, uh, I mean, I use, I'll use John's example. I don't think he'll care. John at some point sat down with me. We had lunch, I don't know, a year or so ago. He's like, I just feel like this isn't what I'm about. This isn't who I am. And I was like, you don't have to be that, John. We don't have to be that. Just because they're doing it and they've had success, well, that's confirmation bias. Let me, let's talk about that real quick. I'll meet people and they'll say, I'm the greatest damn thing ever. Myself included. I was there for so long. And still now I think I'm pretty hot shit, just to be clear. <laughs> I still am a human being. But, but I understand the more I learn, damn, I can't wait to learn more because there's so much out there I don't know. And if I can, when I put this together, I wanted to reach out to Casey Local because I thought I really believe in what the hell this is doing. And I'm, I'm of the belief that now the independence, I'm not saying the, you as a Keller Williams people, you are independent business owners. You don't have to run the same operation as every other KW agent. So you can just make a decision to say, I'm not going to operate like this. And with this NER lawsuit and everything that comes out, I do believe there's going to be very big opportunities for independent brokerages and independent agents to say, I'm going to stand for myself and I'm going to be who I want to be as far as a person-centric real estate practitioner. I believe there's a path for you and we will start to set ourselves truly apart. And the people that are navigating right now with ju just like everyone else, one size fits all, they are going to fall off. So this is a great opportunity for you. I don't uh, do drugs, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have been, I have, I, I've been to Amsterdam twice when I was 19 years old, so let's talk about my homeboy. This is, this man, Mike Ferry was the real estate coach that I had that got me to a point where money, and then before I knew it, money just like controlled everything. Like, oh, as soon as you said, as soon as Reese Nichols, I was in the same office as Angela, not at the same time, but I was in that town center office, and I was top producing team in that office. The, and the first year I was there, and they gave me that trophy, and it said I sold 16 million or whatever it was. And this, hey, this is like 15, 12, 15 years ago. 16 million was like mega number. And um, I remember getting that trophy, and my broker, or someone, Jerry Reese, or someone, was like, uh, you know, what are you going to do next year? And I, but keep in mind, I wasn't offended. I was like, hell yeah, hell yeah, Jerry, I'm going to make you more money, bro. I'm going to put, I'm going to ignore my children. That's what I'm going to do for you, Jerry Reese. <laughs> We can't be happy with where we are. We're always looking forward. Not looking forward like I want to go here. Looking forward like I'm not good enough at this moment. And we got to get out of that stuff. We got to get out of that. Carl Rogers. So I finally found Carl Rogers. He is a psychologist from the 50s and 60s. He's dead, been dead for a long time. But in, in, um, by the way, two books uh, that I re recommend, even if you don't read a book, um, 
But these, but anytime people recommend books, it normally goes in one ear and out the other. The Carl Rogers' book, A Way of Being and Becoming a Person, are the two books that initially changed my career. The way, my outlook, the way I was, I was immediately, I was at Reese. Immediately, I, w I thought, I'm going to start my own brokerage, and it's going to be human-centered uh, interactions. Carl Rogers helped me with that. A way of being and becoming a person. It's complete acceptance, meaning when you go in front of the seller, complete acceptance, meaning we're going to handle objections and we're going to, we're going to try to help them, but I'm not going to try to shove them or push them or judge them. Because what will happen, imagine how a seller feels when you sit down in front of a seller and you say, uh, a seller says, we're thinking about going FISBO. And the agent, which I've seen as I'm mentoring people, I've seen in my own existence, they, the, the seller, um, we, you know, we've been considering going to FISBO. <laughs> oh my God, good luck with that. Is that how you talk to human beings? That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, okay, really read that and don't be afraid to start navigating because what we talk a lot about in Seek is people are like, I don't, you know, 350 just doesn't work for me. 330. It's, that's just you know too little or whatever it is. All these things, numbers, these countertops don't work for me. This, this, this. What I found is a significant amount of time has absolutely nothing to do with why they're putting up objections. It's because there's some other pressure somewhere in their life that they feel I just can't. I, I'm like closed off. This worked for me with everything else in my life. Let me just close off and not make a decision and not move forward, even though I'm in a one-bedroom apartment and I have 17 children. It's that's just human behavior. So if you can start connecting with a client and say, hey, you know what I'm, what I'm sensing in this situation? I don't want to give up too much detail. In this situation is maladaptive coping mechanisms from the other person that's that. To be clear, maladaptive coping mechanism, what is that? A maladaptive coping mechanism, an adaptive coping mechanism is for me to say, hey, Grace, do you want to go have a glass of wine after this? And she says, yeah, and we go have a glass of wine and then we go home for the day. Maladaptive coping mechanisms is when I say, Grace, you want to go have a glass of wine? And she says, yes. And over the course of the next eight hours, we drink about three bottles of wine. That's maladaptive coping mechanisms. Everything can be that, maladaptive. You can say, I like to, I like to work out. Well, if you, have you ever seen people that like to work out to a point where it's unhealthy for them? Yes, maladaptive coping mechanisms. Adapting communication strategies. Uh, understanding and adapting to client personality traits for effective communication. It's so, keep in mind, especially depending on your relationship with the client, if you, if you sit down in front of a client, first of all, men, in my perspective, this is, my perspective will be different than other men's perspectives. My perspective, they know I'm military. They know I'm this, they, I wear suits. So what do men try to be when I sit down with them? Not themselves. They're not themselves. That's my interaction. They're bravado, their toxic masculinity, because they think that's what, they think coming in with the power suit, former military, this guy is going to be all about, you know, some trash stuff. But um, that person, once you d disarm them, because they're armed, because their ego is protecting them, they want to feel accepted. Once you disarm them, then you can start to shift and see, oh, they're actually not that type of person at all. That, that's not even their personality. They were putting on a show. And now, when they see, I have some gruff people I walk with, and we go on walks, and they're like, yeah, you know, UFC, yeah, rah, rah, rah. How many handguns you have? You know, this kind of stuff. I don't judge them. Like, I don't have any handguns, man. I was in the infantry. I had done, I've done enough. Um, but understand that people put up a front in every interaction, even your friends. And if, you can, and if, if you're sitting there saying, well, all my friends love me. I'm just the life of the party. Let me let's address that in this industry. Who here has who here has interacted with agents that believe that all their clients love them and they're the life of the party? Has anyone heard of an agent like that? John, you've never brokered anyone like that, have you? That thought they were the life of the party? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn, now I have to change what I'm gonna say, John. I know your wife. <laughs> so but she's good at it. Yes, of course, of course. But, but here's, the, here's the thing, though. What I see, and that, I'm not talking about John's wife. Thanks a lot, John. <laughs> uh, here's the thing, though. Most agents that I see that I say, hey, have you, this is for years. Hey, have you tried this? Like, this has really been working for me. Not this, anything. Have you really tried, you know, I don't know, breathing differently? <laughs> They'll say, no, no, that's just not closed-minded. That's just not for me. That's just not for me. All my clients love me. You, yeah, what's happening is you're going in, 
they're sharing a front with you. You're also biting into that front that feeds your ego. So the two of you are just feeding each other's ego. You walk away. There's actually no connection occurring. If you go in and you disarm them to the point where the, their ego starts to dissolve, like, well, just so you know, we're not paying that commission. Oh, just so you know, we're, we're talking to other people. I hope it's 12 people. I hope it's 30 because I really like competition. I'm not that arrogant when I'm, when I'm talking to people. We're just having fun, right? Because inside you feel like that sometimes, like, go ahead, go ahead, call your uncle. When he shows up in slippers, then, then tell me that you're not going to hire me. All right, uh, strategies for engaging clients based on the big five profiles of openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Um, enhancing client interactions and satisfaction through tailored communication methods. Let's see if I, let's see if I, if, I'm not reading any of my notes and I love it. A personality style would go, I'm going to go in to Sarah, she's an analytical, I'm just going to uh, throw all that at her. But depending on her needs, rather than judge her, okay, we're at a point where it appears that this person is really in need. What her research is doing is telling me that she is not comfortable making a decision until she has more data. So John takes the initiative to do that. Keep in mind the next day, maybe her father died or something, and then her personality and needs are completely different. But you have to pay attention. Reset button. Every time you, every time you leave, understand, understand that the, the, uh, every saint is a thief in waiting and every thief is a saint in waiting. You can be a thief one day and a saint the next. You could be a saint one day and a thief the next. It just depends on your environment and how you react to that environment in that given situation. And we get into tons of situations, right, where people are stressed. And if you're stressed, you see the worst in people. If you're getting a divorce, you see the worst in people. All right. Building authentic client relationships. The importance of genuine trusted relationships in real estate success. Techniques for, let's see, what is that? Importance of genuine trusted based relationships. What I find, I'm going to use John as an example, uh, and I'm making straight up assumptions because I've never discussed this with John in my life. I, my, it's, it was my opinion when I first sat down with John and I told him this is what I'm about. And John, you hear this and then you tell me if I'm full of stuff. Uh, I believe before John joined, because we knew each other, we knew each other for years, but we, were, we weren't like friends. And I sat down with him and I was like, this is what we're doing at Seek. This is what I believe in. And this is, this is how we're navigating it for a little bit. And I was there. I've been there before. I was, I was a cynical person. I told you. I thought John was like, I think this guy might be full of shit. John, are you willing to admit that or am I wrong? Not full of shit, but, but maybe it's not what he perceives. Maybe. For, I, I mean, before you join, before you join. Before I joined, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't think there was going to be a connection there at all. I thought you were somebody completely different. But pre- when we met and you explained the business and your platform, then I was, I, I didn't think that at that point in time. But I just, you know, I, I think, and you'll agree that most people, perception of you that don't know you is something completely different than who you are. Absolutely. Which I get that as well. Absolutely. And I wasn't, by the way, I'm putting John straight up on the spot, and that's how good our relationship is now. We're in such a good place after a couple of years, but this is what I'm talking about, genuine, trusted-based relationship. I didn't say, John, I'm going to force John to believe this. Right now, I never asked John. I didn't stage this at all. I know and trust that John knows I have my best, the best intent with trying to help everyone in this room with these examples. And I want to share as many real world examples as I can because it's not just what I read in books, it's what I read in books and I applied to my personal life and through my interactions, I've been able to navigate my own system, a way of living, a way of being. Um, But I could tell that John thought that maybe I wasn't what I pitched or perceived was perceived, uh, what I pitched myself to be. And, Understand, I think that that's even more natural in our business. And John's a, a real estate broker. Imagine what your seller and buyers are. They're just on the streets. They're doctors and waitresses and all of these things. You think when you sit down with them, you're like, I really want to help you. I charge X amount, and here's what we're going to do. I'm so excited. Everything, I'm, everyone loves me. You think that they're like, you know what? I just met this person off the street, and I do really love them. Let's be realistic with ourselves. So 
I think it's really important to understand the way you're perceived and to understand that the way to get past that is to dissolve to a point where you're willing to be completely vulnerable, naked in front, not literally naked, completely vulnerable in front of these individuals and say, hey, I understand where you're coming from and I've experienced something like that or I've had that before. Here's something that worked for me before and if that works for you, then I, I really hope the best and, and I'll be there to navigate you through that. That's why I told the John, I was like, hey man, we can do it differently. We don't have to do it the way they tell us we have to do it. We can do it the way we want to do it. And it took time for us to build a relationship to where I now believe, John's never told me this, but I now believe John thinks I legitimately am authentically after his best interest, not just trying to pad my own pocket. Because don't you, can we be profitable? Can we be profitable with sellers? All right. Can we be profitable and still be authentic? Absolutely, for sure. Man, this, this crowd, Kelly, will you start serving alcohol? For real. <laughs> Who wants alcohol? Let's get that going. This place, damn, this, this, uh, this is a rowdy crowd here. I should have put one of those glass things up. Techniques for fostering long-term connections. I skipped through a lot of these stuff because I was just rambling, but let's talk about this one. What techniques, I'm going to get some audience participation because you guys are falling asleep now. Techniques for fostering long-term connections with clients through understanding and empathy. Share with me now. Now, my part's done. Now we're getting the crowd involved. Tell me, who wants to share? Who's willing to expose themselves and be vulnerable? Because what happens, let's let here, my experience in a crowd is that if I was in a crowd and a presenter like myself when I was newer in the business, I would sure as hell never speak up. Are you insane? What would that guy maybe think of me? What would he judge me of? Oh, I, he seems to know a lot more than I do. Ugh, I don't even put myself out there. I promise you I'm not judging you. You say anything. You say you say something that you think is the dumbest thing ever, and I'm like, wow, I really can see where they come from with that. And I'm dead serious. I like to joke a lot, but I'm dead serious. So ask your questions. There is no dumb answer. I'll connect with you. Anyone? Barb, techniques for fostering long-term connections with clients? You, you're you the client queen. I, well, I guess I think um, you said it when we were meeting with someone recently, and I never heard it in the way that what is important to me in my life, um, when I make that a priority, real estate falls into place. I don't announce that I'm a real estate agent. I don't wear my name tag to you know, the gym when I'm working out or the PTO meeting. The people that get to know me that I connect with on a long-term connection, on a relationship, they will want to work with me if it's the right fit because they know who I am and how I operate and how I treat other people. So I think real estate is, I don't want to say it's the bottom of my list, but it's not, it's not what I talk about and what I'm forming relationships on. Uh, but I also am not a big cold lead person either. That's just my personal preference for my business, but a lot of it falls into what you're talking about because I do want it to be more of a relationship based transaction. And that's hard to do with a total stranger. Or it takes a lot longer to get there. So. Absolutely. That is, that is great feedback. And for those who don't know Barb, I know a lot of seek people, definitely seek people do. If you don't know Barb, her clients, every client, I, someone told me that she's sneaky selling all the time. Like she's sneaky selling. All, she's just everywhere. She never is even trying to sell us anything. She just is just contributing. And by doing so, it attracts, attracts people to you. Um, and then when you treat those people right and you don't use them, so then when the when the listing closes, guess what the client may want in a week or two? Anyone want to guess? You know what they want. To hear from you? Maybe? Maybe? I don't know. That's a novel concept. Let's talk about when you ask for referrals. No, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end with that. That's a great ending. Um, that's the way I wrote it anyway. <laughs> Stay on task, Michael. Damn. Uh, who else wants to talk about techniques for fostering long-term? Oh, Angela. Angela, just so you know, is a broker. She was, uh, I, she was a broker here. Angela was a broker here. And we are still dear friends because I don't judge her for making decisions that's best for her and her family. So welcome, Angela, if I didn't welcome you on the, initially. But I know you haven't spoken, and you're one of the most experienced people in this room. So do, would you like to share, please? I'm not a good sharer right now because I have not followed my clients. I've taken it See, so I'm not good at, 
I mean, I will say I foster this, but I stay in touch with them constantly. I do the swing haircuts. I do the fix bumps. I do the grip When they move in, I always take them to the sidewalk. You know, because I know they're exhausted from moving. Uh, you know, in the year, I always reach out to them if they have a home work. You can say, hey, your work is coming through. I send them their year in tax statement. They bought or sold in that year. I mean, there are a lot of things I do, but I uh, I have very, I have a few. We all do that when they close the 30 days, we're glad they're out of our lives. But I still try to keep in touch with them also because some of them have served me for two minutes and got lifelong friends. What's interesting is, did you notice the humility where Angela's like, oh, I don't really, I'm asking her techniques for fostering long-term connections, and she's like, I don't really have any. I mean, I just really adopt my clients. I just love them. <laughs> Do you notice that empathy and that humility in that statement? That's a human being. She's treating her clients like human beings. That's what I'm talking about. But what's, what I have found is it's the people that don't say, she did not say, all my clients love me. Did she? She actually seemed to doubt that in my perspective. She seemed to doubt that, uh, I, don't, yeah, I don't even think, I don't know, I just love them. That's what I'm talking about. If she would have been like, well, let me tell you this, my clients think I'm the stuff. That's number one warning sign of a maladaptive coping mechanism, and you got to look at what's causing it to make you feel insignificant, to feel like you don't have the skill set in order to be your true self in front of a client. And what that I found to be is normally lack of education. Let me, let me go back. This education, like I said, is just my experience I'm sharing with you. You d use it or not, and if, it, if you think it's trash, it, fine. This is a hypothesis or a theory. What do you do with a theory? You take it and you test it. So if you think this theory might be up to something, then go take it and test it. Anyone else? Anyone else? I don't, this, is your, this is the crowd time. I don't want to keep going. So um, I know everyone in the room is either a parent or a child. Obviously, not everybody is a parent, but you are a child, so you have a parent. Look <laughs> at that sentence right there. Techniques for fostering long-term connections with if I throw the word kid there or parent there, it just makes all of this so clear. Like, I'm not preaching to my kids on a regular basis why I'm a good parent. I'm not doing that at all, right? Why I'm a good throw the word here with I'm trying to connect with them daily, weekly, monthly. Some days are good days, some days are bad days. Some days they win, some days I win. I'm like, it's very basic when I look at it from a relationship with my parent or my kid. And I think we overcomplicated it in our industry um, because of a lot of the things that you said, but it's, it's just interesting. That just hit me kind of like what I'm doing on the daily with my kids. Well said. Sheila? Yeah, and coming from the corporate sales world, even then I felt very strongly that um, one of my mentors told me at one point, people don't work with companies they like, they work with people they like. So it's all about your relationship and kind of everything else falls away. Absolutely. Every, this is great. This is great. You guys, come on. Come on. Come on. This is unusual. Come on. Well, of course. Uh, let me relate. I understand because you're in a company you don't, you've never been here before. You don't know what, I, what I'm about. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm nefarious. Maybe this is all completely understandable. Maybe you'll say something, and then when you leave, it, like, did you hear her? She said that. Ask my agents. Do you think I would ever say that? Kim? Kim's about Kim is the straightest shooter in this room. Kim, you think when they leave, no matter what they say, will I ever say anything about them? I try to get them to talk shit anymore. Literally, if you say something like a text, you go off and just respond. Like, cool, I think that's a great insight. Cool, that's fine. That'll work for you. I think we would all try to make everything an experience. So, for example, like I had a listing appointment and the seller walked me around the home because Mr. Seller was sick and had to stay in one room. Uh, when I left, I'm not trying to say everybody loves me, but uh, when, when, every, when I left, I just made like a, a basket of, you know, good little stuff, like teas. And so my point is, is like just to go more narrow than, than wide, you know, if, like look at exactly what that person needs and it's not real estate related maybe and try to fill that need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go, I mean, you guys are speaking our language. Honestly, we're authenticity is huge for us. Every single person in our company is who they are. And to their clients, they're not trying to be anything else. Um, and I'm not super salesy. 
I have bargaining background, <laughs> um, so I did not get any formal training. I just kind of learned. Um, but I know people, and I know what people need and how they need you to help them and service them um, and how to figure that out. Um, going back to the empathy thing, it's coincidentally, I've said this phrase literally every day this week, which is so strange, but it goes back to whatever the situation is, if somebody's stressed, if somebody's like, in you know panic mode or anything it's not about the damn dishes right like what is it actually about it's not about this negotiation it's about what happened today are you having a bad day do you need to sleep on it like you know it's not about that so really not just and being an active listener i literally just sat down with an agent myself and the whole coffee meeting i was like he's not listening to me as i'm like speaking i'm like he's not listening to anything i'm saying right now and when we got done, he didn't ask me a single thing about me. And I was like, this is not gonna work. Because it's like, I yeah, I could just see, if you're doing it to me, like you're gonna do that to clients. And that's not, you can't represent us if you're not really truly there to help people. Because that's just, I don't know, we work too hard to risk that reputation. And we really care about our people. Like we genuinely like love our people that our clients, our friends, our co-ops, like anything, we truly take care of people. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, according to Angela, loving your clients, I mean, she's not yeah, really yeah, doing yeah, anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I do appreciate your opinion, so please continue to contribute. But men in psychological studies, and I'm, I'm making this number up because I don't remember it exactly, but most men in uh, the consensus in major psychological studies is that men spend approximately 70% of conversations with both men and women attempting either doing or attempting to talk about themselves. And you're like, yeah, Michael, you've been up there talking about yourself for this entire hour. We know, bro. <laughs> but that's, that is true. I have to present up here. If you ever sit down with me one-on-one, -on -one, it's not like this in, in, the, in the least. Grace, is this normally how it is when you interact with me? <laughs> I have to, I have to, are you not entertained? <laughs> but men spend 60 some percent of the time, 70% uh, almost, talking about themselves it's important to acknowledge that because once I learned that and I thought well I'm not doing that I really I when I'm in conversation I hardly ever talk but that's because of my background it's much different but um, in most interactions they spend about 70 percent of their time at, uh, specifically talking about themselves and it is I'm not just saying they spend 70 percent of their time talking because if you could talk about ideas for 70% of the time, everyone would love it. Just talk about ideas. But if you talk about yourself, that's different. And understand once you realize that that's what the problem is, it doesn't define, I think this is where people get so uptight when I say certain things, they're like, oh, he doesn't like me because I do this. No, I've done the same thing. And I'll probably do it in two weeks and I'll pick up on it and I'll be like, oh, I disgust myself. What a disgusting individual. That is your ego, Michael. So when I pick on things, it's not, the same goes with you. When you say, well, this is what I'm, a, I do have a magnet on my car. I do think all my clients love me. It's me, me, me. I do talk 70% of the time. Understand those are just symptoms to a problem. And all you have to do is be aware of the symptom so you can look at it head on and solve the problem. It doesn't define who you are. You are not your actions. You are only your actions if you become aware of them and choose to still do them again. Done? Um, all right, the role of consistent personalized interactions in client retention and referral generation. It's really important because I see it so much. I see it so much. Because of my positions and the things that I've done in the past, I always reach out, um, she's not here. Uh, we have an agent in the company that I, I recruited for eight years from day one and took seven years for her to come over. It took seven years, but I was consistently, this is just like your clients, sellers and buyers, consistently following up, not to say you should join Seek. How are you? What's up? You want to grab lunch? No, of course, if, if I can expose someone to myself and maybe they, they connect, then there's an opportunity, of course, but that's not my intention. So for seven years, I'm just Hey, I haven't talked to you in six months. Hey, I haven't talked to you in three months. What's up? Texting. And I, ne I, was, I remain consistent in that. What I see agents do, I'm of no value to them. But when they kind of are struggling or, uh-oh, NAR lawsuit time. NAR lawsuit. And I remember Michael was the president of KCRER and the president of the MLS. And what do you know how many texts I get from agents like, hey, you want to go grab lunch or something? I'm not being judgmental. 
but I, in a way, I guess I kind of am. Um, we have to be better about interacting with people truly for them and not for us. Because I know there are agents that texted me with this, when this lawsuit came out that I had, I can see the thread of 30 texts over eight years and I never heard back from you. And we've went to, we've been in Las Vegas together, you know, like at conferences and things. That's completely fine. It doesn't offend me. You don't owe me anything. So I keep trying to reach out because I believe in helping people. And if you're there, great. And if you're not, fine. But once you need something from me, I, in eight years and 25 messages, you don't have any reason to say, I'm not interested in meeting with you right now. But when you need me, because this lawsuit, no oh shit, my career might be over with. Okay, Michael can help me now. I, of course, will, because I'm a sucker. No, I honestly believe in what I'm doing. Um, but we have to be better about that because the client sees it as well. You don't talk to your client for three years, then all of a sudden you see them at Target and they're like, oh yeah, we've been actually thinking about you know selling our house actually. Oh, and now you're like, hey, Susie, what's up? Oh my gosh, you want to go to lunch and all this stuff. We've got to stop doing that. The client's like, oh, that's gross. You're not my friend. Be their friend or don't be their friend. Be their friend for real, not just because you need something from them. That's how you have a consistent um, behavior. I was their friend for real, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. Actionable takeaways. All right. Assess your own personality traits and consider how these might impact your professional interactions. How might you assess what you're currently doing? Kim, you haven't, we're going to, before we're done, Kim is, Kim is actually one of the most tenured in this room as well. We need more Kim input. I see you now, I forgot. All right. Uh, Self-assessment. Just look at yourself and what you're doing. When a client fired you and you're like, and you protect yourself, understandably so, by saying, uh, it was just them. They were just getting divorced, and they're just pieces of cheese. Uh, why don't you relook at that situation and say, "What? Don't blame them for anything. What did I do wrong?" And don't even look at what did I do wrong. Why not say, "What could I have done differently to connect with them so they wouldn't have fired me?" Because everyone's opinion is their own, and it is valid because it is theirs. So. They had opinions that you were unaware of or you were aware of and you ignored. And um, we have to be careful with that. Everyone loves me. I'm just the life of the party thing because I find that that is so, such a self-limiting behavior that so many agents, when they call me with problems, this client fired me. This client is pissed at me. This, this, this. It often has to do with communication and the fact that the agent makes everything about themselves and not about what the client actually is trying to say and need. And it, it comes back to you say something all I'm thinking about is what I'm getting ready to say next. So we really got to relook. We, we have to look at that again. Look at every situation you've had. What can you do to improve your business? Client observations. All right, here we go. Adv I'm advising you to practice observing the identifying personality traits of their clients. Name some. We don't, I don't have time for all this stuff. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's get to let's get to questions and answers. Um, and I'll delve into any stories that you'd like to do as well. Um, let me. While you are figuring out what you want to ask, Kim, do you want to ask the first question? Or make the first comment? I want to make sure I don't have anything golden here I need to miss. No, I would say, I think I've learned this about being a progression enthusiast. And so you have to constantly be improving your skills. And so that's something that I think I've learned about being a progression enthusiast. I had a partner for a while, and she would... Um, if she didn't get a listing, she'd come back, and I mean, she would just be emotionally and physically upset about it. And I'm like, it's okay. Like, so did, you, did you just go after the next one? And I mean, she's a big time heavy hitter, and it's like, really, it's, an, it's okay. There's probably a reason. And then I would say my other thing is just read the room, especially when you have a couple or more than one decision maker and maybe you know one is a little more assertive but you need to ask the other one that's quiet some questions too and include them because maybe they really at the end of the day when the door is closed they're the final decision maker i love that so we we should probably delve into that for one second that who's the decision maker thing we've got to stop judging oh the woman's the decision maker oh the man who We've got to stop that. We've got to stop that because you don't know. 
And does anyone remember one of the techniques I've used? Does anyone remember? Seek people. The techniques I've used to try to flush out who's the decision maker immediately. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, everyone's going to. You do? Taylor, do you remember? Damn, someone was listening. I come into the kitchen when I look through the house. I come into the kitchen and I say, where would you like me to sit? And I don't look at anyone in the eye. And I don't address anyone directly. Where would you like me to sit? And whoever pipes up and tells me where to sit is the person that's the decision maker. It's not always true, but it's very reliable. So try that sometime. Where do you want me to sit? Don't look at anybody. Be like in your computer or something. Be like, oh yeah, all right, we'll go in the kitchen. Where do you want me to sit? Who pipes up? Who tells me where to sit? That's the decision maker. You stay long enough, I, every once in a while I got these little gold nuggets. I also wanted to say progressive Indians versus best, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 I just texted Dan, so I want to forget because Grace, what is that term? Why is that term so important to you? I, I feel like I just resonate with it because I feel like I always want to be learning and like reading and progressing. And I think progression is key to a lot of things and a lot of success. And I just have never heard that. And then to label yourself a progression theory is just I just like the verbiage. And it really struck me. So just feel it. Thank you. That's great. And, and from what I see on the outside, that's. To me, that's creativity. That's more treating this like art instead of transactional. And I'm very growth mindset. It's just like another word for growth mindset. Absolutely. That's a good point. Barb said, uh, I think the lack of it is why we were in the lawsuit we were in. I think that's pretty accurate, right? Would you think? I think so. I want to do because this is that thing early. I do remember something. Remember early, I was like, no, I want to save that for the very end. I got. I can't believe I remembered it. Um, now I'll forget it. No. <laughs> what is the last thing that you want to do after your client buys or sells a home? Ask for a referral. Ask for referral, right? We've all learned that. That is, that is what I would consider to be the correct answer. However, we've got to take. A, we have to take another step. What else? Anyone else can think? Because that's not wrong. Because that's where I'm going. Yeah. Oh, a review, but let's be even more specific. Let's be even. Oh, you want them to talk about how great of a job you did. Uh, different, different. Here we go. Here's what I'm going to ask. What? Thank you. What you could do better. All right, so this is what I'm going to ask you. We don't have time. We don't have a lot of time for all this, but here's what I want to do. So watch, like this, like this. I've been very selective. <laughs> So I could ignore you this whole hour, and you would have just thought at home. Just kidding. All right. Raise your, out of, a, out of a 1 to 10 grading of my performance and the content here, if you thought it was worth 1 out of 10, raise your hand. Do you think it was worth 1 out of 10, 1 being the worst? And you could be complete, completely, I know, she doesn't know, I know what her answer is. So a 2, raise your hand when the number rings a bell. A 3? A four, eventually I want everyone's hand up. A five, a six, I'm serious, you can, I have no judgment. I want to show you no judgment. I want to show you no judgment. Seven, seven, could, could stay on task, could, <laughs> could, could stay on task, could, could um, stay focused, stop trying to joke, stop being all over the place. Uh, let's see. See, this is empathy. I, I don't want to add, I, of course, your client, you don't want to play these games, but I have the opportunity, I have the floor. Um, stop with filler words. Stop trying to be three places. Stop trying to tell anecdotal stories. Keep going. Eight? Anyone? Eight? All right, all right. Good, that's most people. Nine? You better not be a 10, man. Okay. <laughs> Taylor's opinion doesn't count. Daniel, Taylor's opinion doesn't count. He's like, it was a 10. It, it was actually an 11, Michael. He knows, he knows. All right, well, that's the thing I want you to remember is I don't believe that, I'm not asking anyone for business here. I told you I would not recruit. Anyone who's here from, not from the company, I'm not trying to recruit you. Um, but what I'm saying is I don't believe if you call and ask the client for business 
after closing and you've never asked them how you did, then you don't have the right to ask them from our business. And I believe that to be the case. All right, anyone else?